Good evening, Sage Garden family. Good to see you again. Uh, time for church. I hope you can find you a comfy spot there and get your Bible in hand. And uh, don't get too comfortable. I don't want to put anybody to sleep. But uh, we want to study God's Word again tonight. Before we do, just a reminder, uh, tomorrow, Thursday, is the National Day of Prayer. So I, I hope that you'll take advantage of that opportunity and, and uh, spend some time praying. Tomorrow we have much to pray about. Uh, certainly a time our nation needs to be on its knees. So be praying tomorrow during the National Day of Prayer. And also, uh, just in case you need a reminder, this coming Sunday is Mother's Day. It'll be an unusual Mother's Day. Uh, we won't be having a face-to-face -to -face service. I was hoping that we would be able to do so, and I hope that you're praying uh, specifically that we'll be able to open soon and have face-to-face -face gatherings. I guess we could have service if we headed outside. Don't know what the weather's supposed to be like, but maybe that's something on the horizon. Do be praying for those things. I'm going to ask you a few questions before we uh, get started and have a season of prayer together. First of all, how has your schedule changed since the nation has been on the stay-at-home order, since we've been battling with this uh, coronavirus? How has your day-by-day -day schedule changed? Secondly, have you been as faithful to our video services as you were to our live face-to-face -face services uh, I'm glad to see some of you chiming in and let me know that you're watching. Uh, glad that you are this evening, and we really do miss you. But uh, are you praying for us to open again soon? Will you make that a specific matter of prayer that you take before the Lord? Um, and, and are you praying for each other, uh, lifting each other up in prayer? Are you uh, finding ways to connect with each other? Uh, I've been blessed uh, just this past week to receive cards from a few people, just uh, reminders, Bible verses, encouraging words, and I'm so thankful for that. But, you know, it's something that we can do. Sonia and I last night uh, uh, bowed before the Lord in our living room and prayed specifically for uh, eight or nine different cards that we're sending out, uh, hopefully to be an encouragement to you. Uh, so you know that we haven't forgot you, and we miss seeing you and hope to see you again very soon. Let's, let's not become isolated just because the world around us is isolated. It's interesting, you know, you see hundreds of people in the Lowe's parking lot and in the Walmart parking lot, uh, and, and it's, it's easy to be able to, to get out and see people that way. Uh, I've often said if one of the best places to visit is in Walmart, but honestly, I haven't seen any of you here this time. I saw Brother Billy one of the first Tuesday mornings when they had that senior time, when you could come an hour before they opened, saw him there. We were all searching for toilet paper together, but uh, it, it's good to see each other, each other, but let's just pray for each other and find ways to keep connecting and keep reaching out and staying together during this crazy, difficult time that we're living. So before we open God's word tonight together and study, let's pray together and bring our request before the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the freedom that we have because Jesus is our great high priest to come boldly before the throne of grace to receive mercy. And Lord, that's what we need. We need grace and we need mercy during these days especially we thank you for the privilege lord to be able to pour our hearts out to you and to share our life with each other in fellowship i pray this evening god that you might be honored and glorified with uh with uh, your the message that i'm about to share i pray you would have us uh, to have ears to hear uh, lord give us a willingness in our hearts to uh, allow you to speak to us and, and be willing to be obedient in the things that you point out. I'm, I'm thankful today that we have a personal Savior, a personal God who knows our every need, who knows where we are inside and out, and who knows the exact things we need to hear 
and be exposed to, to follow your will and your plan. Lord, we do pray for our nation. Uh, Lord, we pray for the turmoil that many are in today because of this uh, coronavirus. Many who uh, are still out of work. Many are wondering how they're going to pay their bills. Lord, uh, many are coming face to face each day with the possibility of being exposed to this virus because they work in healthcare professions. And God, we do pray that you might protect them. Uh, we pray, Lord, for those first responders that have to be on the scene. Lord, they're, uh, they're in danger all the time. Please bless them and protect them. Be with our law enforcement officers. God, we are so thankful for those who stand before us to keep us safe. We do pray, Lord, for our, our, um, our nation's leaders. We pray for our president, Lord, that you might strengthen him, undergird him with your watch care, give him wisdom, Lord, that he needs, help him to know who to listen to and who not to listen to. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you might work your perfect will out in our world today. There's so much that we can be fearful of, there's so many things that, that we don't understand. That we really don't know who to listen to. I pray you might give us uh, godly wisdom. Lord, we might listen to you first. Uh, we pray your blessings upon our time tonight. Lead us and guide us into your truth. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to continue our study this evening in the book of Hebrews. So if you'll take your Bibles there and turn to Hebrews chapter number 5, verses 1 to 10. Last week I introduced a subject that I mentioned we would be talking about for the next few weeks. The next few chapters in the book of Hebrews uh, are about our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we closed last week with verse 16 of chapter 4, and we'll use that as a way to introduce tonight's message. It says in verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I, I don't know about you, but uh, this week especially, that, that verse has been an awful lot to me because we're in a time of need. We truly are. And as that verse says that we, as the children of God, can boldly come before the very throne of God because of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I noticed in the passage there that the throne of God is called a throne of grace. And I said, I don't know how many times this week, Lord, I need more grace. Oh, I need your grace. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Not a favor that we deserve or could ever earn. But grace is the unmerited favor. The fact that God favors us. Though no one else may favor us, God favors us. Uh, and and, and we, we can come to the throne of grace. And it says to obtain mercy. Mercy is... Uh, receiving that which we don't deserve. Um, we deserve condemnation because every one of us are sinners, really. We fail the Lord every single day. Uh, we need mercy. That is God not giving us what we deserve. We deserve condemnation, but instead he gives us salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been spending time moving through the book of Hebrews and we're looking at the first 10 verses of chapter 5 tonight. Uh, last week we learned an important truth about Jesus, our great high priest. The fact is he understands our weaknesses and all of our temptations because he was tempted on all points, yet without sin. Um, we can find great confidence and boldness in our position in Christ because he is our great high priest. There isn't a priest on this planet today who qualifies like Jesus qualified to be our high priest. There are qualifications for priests in verses uh, 1 to 10. Actually, it's talking about the qualifications 
of a priest. The writer of Hebrews has spoken about Jesus earlier being better. I said that was a key word. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron's priesthood. In fact, he stated he is our great high priest. And this theme is going to be repeated throughout the next few chapters. So today we're just looking at Jesus, our high priest, what he did and what that means to us. What I want you to do is look at this passage today and ask yourself, what does it say about Jesus? And, this, and then ask yourself, how does this apply to my life? How does it apply to me where I live? Uh, the New Testament teaches us that God became one of us. He became one of us. His son Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, who has existed from all eternity, who created the world himself, left the majesty and perfection of heaven and entered human history by being born in a stable in a little town called Bethlehem. God became man that day. He became one of us so that we could become one with God. Now, there's nothing standing between you and me, you and God, if you're saved. Nothing at all. You may say, well, you, you don't understand. I'm a sinner. And that's true. In fact, the Bible itself says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus paid a price for our sin. The good news is that God's grace is available to everyone. This Sunday morning, I'm going to be preaching on the subject of God's grace being available to everyone. Forgiveness is yours through Jesus. And we can approach his throne of grace with great boldness and confidence. And we can be sure to receive mercy and grace because he promised that we could. That's what Jesus came to make available for all of us who are willing to call upon his name. So when you think about the qualities we find in our great high priest, it's something to truly appreciate. Tonight, I hope that Jesus is exalted and that when you learn more about him, you will appreciate what you have in him. But at the same time, you will want to imitate him. So the title of the message tonight is A Qualified High Priest to appreciate, and to imitate. If you want to be forgiven, if you want to be clean, if you want to be spiritually connected to God, the God of the universe, you can do that. Jesus made it all possible. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus. Trust him as your Lord and Savior, and you'll have that right relationship with him. Hebrews 5 tells us about Jesus, our high priest, it also shows us what a life he lived and what a life lived right is supposed to look like. So before we go on, let's read the text together, and then we'll go back, and I'll show, with you, show you three different ways that you and I can reach our full potential in God by following his example as our great high priest. Verse number one, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. That's an overall statement about what a priest is. Is someone who is taken from men and he's taken uh, for men, that is to offer sacrifices and gifts on behalf of men. Then verse 2 says, who can have compassion on the ignorant? And that isn't meant to be... Uh, um, um, a term of uh, criticism at all because uh, it simply means unlearned people, ignorant, unlearned. It says, and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. What he's saying there is a, a human priest uh, can have compassion on the ignorant and on people who are out of the way because he himself is human and he himself has struggled with his infirmities. Verse 3 says, And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sin. So unlike Jesus, our great high priest, a human priest 
one who is called in behalf of other men, is still a sinner. And not only does he have to offer sacrifices for others, he also has to offer sin sacrifices for himself. Unlike the Savior what, that we learned last week, who was tempted in all points yet without sin. So that's a big distinction. Verse 4 is, it says, No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. And so those first four verses are referring to the human priest, the priesthood under Aaron. Verse 5 turns the attention to our great high priest, Jesus. Verse 7, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he saith also in another place, that other place, if you're taking notes, is Psalm 110. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now before we go too far along, you have to be wondering who in the world is Melchizedek. And I'll talk more about him in a couple weeks when we cover chapter 7. Uh, for today, just know that Melchizedek was a mysterious character in the Old Testament. He was a priest who made a very brief appearance. I believe it's only three verses in Genesis chapter 14 that refer to Melchizedek. We'll see how he is actually a type of Christ himself. Some commentators believe that he was a pre-incarnate Christ. I don't know if I agree with that or not, but I believe that he was a human that exemplified some traits of Jesus Christ, He's, but he was a priest, and he was a king, and he was a prophet, and so that's what makes him similar to the Lord Jesus. But the writer is saying here, Jesus didn't come to do his own will. So the first thing that, that, that we need to understand, through the first way that we can reach our full potential in God is by following Jesus' example and the fact that he sought the call of God. So seek God's call for your life there in verses 4 to 6. Um, the writer is saying Jesus didn't come to do his own will. He didn't come to choose his own path. He came to do what the Father called him to do. Jesus said in John 5, verse number 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. Imagine that. Jesus said that. Jesus, the Son of God, said that. He said, I can't do anything of myself. He says, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek my, not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So Jesus came to do God's will, not his own will. And it's an example for each one of us, one that we can follow. If you want to reach your full potential in this life that God has given you, you have to acknowledge that you belong to him. He's the one who made you. And so you should be seeking his will for your life. You know, God has a plan for your life, a calling for you to follow. And part of your mission in this life is to discover that calling and then spend the rest of your life doing that calling. Try to see yourself as a steward of the life that God has given you to glorify himself. Find your purpose and your reason for living in him and his purpose. That's what Jesus did. He lived his entire life to accomplish the purpose for which his father sent him. Now, I'm thinking, especially during these days when seniors are graduating from high school and graduating from college, and uh, one of the first questions that people ask them is, well, what are you going to do now? Or what are you going to do with your life? And just, it's amazing to me how so many seniors 
uh, get out of high school and you ask them, well, what are you going to do next? And they say, well, I'm going to go to college. And so what are you going to study? Well, I'm not sure yet. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go to college. Like, that's the natural thing to do, just go to college. Why not be praying, God, what would you have me prepare for? Would you even, is it even within your plan for me to go to college? Is there some other work that you have prepared for me to do? Are you seeking God's will? That should be the first question we ask ourselves. What does God want you to do? What is his purpose for you? And you know, if you know yourself and you see yourself through the eyes of the scriptures, and you evaluate your abilities, your gifts, your talents, you should have some inkling as to what the purpose of God is for you. It may not be the most popular profession. It may not be the, the, the most uh, uh, lucrative profession. But what are you here for? Now, I've often thought, being in the ministry for 30 years, what would have happened to me if I had went to pharmacy school, because that's really the direction I was going in when I got out of the Air Force. I had some good training in the military. I worked in the pharmacy there. I enjoyed that job. I know that being a pharmacist is a, can be a very uh, lucrative profession, and I even had some in my family say that, that you're crazy for going into the ministry and not going into pharmacy school. And I've often thought back over 30 years, you know, what if I had made that decision? Where would I be today? Would I even be alive today? And I have to look back over 30 years and the people that I've known and got to meet and the people that I've ministered to and the people that have ministered to me, uh, the, the life experiences that God has allowed me to enjoy, the family that I have, uh, what, how he's worked in my kid's life. I don't know if any of that would have happened had I made that decision. I'm glad today that I chose to follow the will of God for my life. I'm so glad. Uh, do you know what God's will is for you? In, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we know those verses are very familiar. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We know those verses. We all, most of us have them memorized already. But are you familiar with the next verse? Verse 9, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, those good works. Question, if you were an artist and you painted a picture, when you finished painting the picture, you, uh, you, you signed your autograph on the bottom of the picture, to whom would that picture belong? Would it belong to you? Yes, it would. Uh, so as the owner of that picture, could you as the owner do anything you wanted to do with that picture? Absolutely, you could. Uh, wouldn't you use that picture that you drew to accomplish the purpose for which you painted that picture? The Bible says that we, children of God, we are his workmanship, his picture. He created us. Psalm 139 says that God knew us before we were ever an inkling in our father and mother's eyes. He knew us while we were in our mother's womb. It says he was familiar with all of our members. And he was pleased with us. And he has a calling on our life, a purpose for us. Are we accomplishing his purpose or is, is it all about us? What I want to see, what I want to have, what I want to accomplish. Are we accomplishing? Jesus lived his entire life to accomplish his father's purpose. Even though that purpose meant going to an old rugged cross. Jesus lived his life. It was a short life too. 33 and a half years. That's very young today even. Um, but he did something in those 33 and a half years that most people never accomplished in their whole 70 years. Seek to find your purpose in him. God doesn't want to, to keep his plans a secret. He's not trying to hide it from you. 
In fact, um, it would be crazy for him to do that. He wants you to know what it is, and he'll reveal it to you if you ask him and if you listen to him. Why would God reveal his purpose for your life if he knew that you wouldn't fulfill it? See, it's an amazing thing. We, we can pray and we say, God, what is your will for my life? And we can say those words out loud. And at the same time, in our hearts be saying, I hope you say something I like. Why would he reveal to us what his will is if he knows, he knows we wouldn't do it in the first place? When God calls us, he wants to do an extraordinary thing in us. He wants us to be extraordinary. Uh, he's, he's gifted each of us in specific ways. Just like he did his son. We need to have a willingness to do what he calls us to do. So seek to know what God's will is for you. If you want to reach your full potential. I wonder what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. And when... Uh, the Lord Jesus on, at the judgment seat of Christ examines our, our life, knowing what our potential was. I wonder if we will be disappointed because we didn't reach our full potential. Many of us will never reach our full potential because we're not interested in knowing what God's purpose is. So that's the first thing you need to do. Second thing is make your devotional life a top priority. Make it a number one priority. Look at verse number seven in the text. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. You know, when you read the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus, the Son of God, even Jesus, Spent a great deal of time in prayer, a great deal of time talking to the Father. Even though he was God in the flesh, he spent a great deal of time in prayer. Note these different passages. Write them down. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. Luke's gospel, chapter 5, verse 16. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And then in Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. That's Jesus. Took time to pray. And of course, one of the most famous prayers... Was in, was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let me set that up. He actually had his disciples with him. And he, he said, let's go over here and you wait right here. I'm going to go yonder and pray. So he says, pray with me, watch with me, and I'm going to go yonder and pray. And so he went and prayed. In, verse, in Matthew 26, verse 33, notice what happened. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Jesus was able to find strength, renewal, and power through prayer. A devotional life. A life of prayer was so vital to the Lord Jesus. Now, you think about his example during his lifetime. If the Son of God needed to pray in order to fulfill his purpose on this earth, imagine how much more you and me need to pray. I find that it's one of the most difficult disciplines for the believer. I think it is because Satan knows how very powerful prayer is. Well, I think if, if believers learn to pray and pour out their hearts to God, they'd put most psychologists out of business. Because most of the time when you go to the psychologist, 
they're just listening to you anyway. I'm thankful that, that there are people in that profession that can give us help and ask us questions to make us think, but many times it's simply somebody to listen to. You know what? If you're a child of God tonight, he will listen to you anytime. He will listen to you at 2 o'clock in the morning when nobody else is awake in the house. He will listen to you. He's wide awake. The Bible says the God of Israel never sleeps nor slumbers. You can go to him in prayer. I want you to notice something else in Matthew 26 that I didn't read earlier. Matthew 26, 40, verse 40. It says, And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? That must have been a haunting question that Peter continued to hear throughout his life. All Jesus asked the disciples to do was stay here and watch with me. Watch with me. I'm going to pray over there. You stay here and watch with me. And then he said, you mean, Peter, that you couldn't watch one hour? You couldn't pray one hour. What a rebuke. What a loving rebuke, but it was a rebuke. Um, what strikes me is the fact that we live our life day to day, and, and we live it so easily without God. Oh, he's there. He's with us. But I don't think we realize he's with us sometimes. As long as things are going relatively well, we're good. When life gets a little tough, we might throw out a prayer or two. It's only when life becomes overwhelming that we start to offer prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears, just like Jesus did. But in all reality, we need to do this in good times as well, calling out to God, knowing him and growing in him as well. If you want to fulfill your calling in life, God's purpose for your life. If you want to reach your full potential, make your devotional life a priority. Pray and read the Word of God and meditate upon what you read. It's so important that you ingest what you read because the Word of God becomes alive in us when we meditate upon it. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 is very clear. Only three words in the verse, pray without ceasing. If you want to endure hardship, if you want to be able to finish the work that God has called you to do, be a person of prayer. Be a person who makes his personal devotions a priority in his life. Talk to God about what's going on. I'll be honest with you, some of the things that have, have been going on this past four weeks have just... Uh, uh, they've really shaken me in a lot of ways. Uh, conspiracy theories, videos that I've watched um, uh, from so-called experts saying that there's some underlying thing going on. And it's, it's a very fearful thing, a very fearful place to be in, almost overwhelming because we're in a position that we don't have control over anything, it seems like. When you cannot meet together face-to-face uh, -face in God's house, even though the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States says that Congress shall make no law that will prohibit the free exercise of religion or the freedom of speech. And yet it's being violated every day in North Carolina as well as in other states. The Constitution was written even during times of epidemics, even during times of health issues, and yet... People were still allowed to worship. It's very, uh, it, it's, it's unsettling. And it's something we need to pray, truly pray about. So many businesses are never going to come back after this thing. Uh, I, I'm fearful that many churches will not come back after this thing. It's so encouraging to see my church family chiming in. Um, letting me know that you're listening. I wish that you were here. But until we can meet again, let's be faithful. Let's establish that pattern of making our 
personal devotions a priority in our life. Lastly, here's a third way to help us reach out, reach our potential in God. And it's not necessarily an easy thing either. Verses 8 and 9 tell us, be ready to grow through suffering and obedience. Verse number 8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. What does that mean? Uh, he learned obedience. Uh, and he was made perfect. Does it mean that at some point he, Jesus had been disobedient? Does it mean that at some point he had been imperfect? No, that's not what the writer's saying at all. Here's what it means. Jesus came to this earth to be fully human. He was 100% human and 100% God. You say, how's that possible? <clears throat> well, it's possible because he's God. <clears throat> Excuse me. With God, all things are possible. Amen? It means that he came to this earth to be fully human. He was literally one of us. He subjected himself to the same limitations that you and I have. When Jesus was tired, he needed to sleep. When he was hungry, he needed to eat. When he worked with the woodwork, probably got some splinters in his hands. Uh, some people paint Jesus as this meek and mild, weak need Savior. But I want you to remember something. He worked in a carpenter shop. He probably hit his thumb a few times with a with a hammer. He uh, with a hammer. He probably had some calluses on his hands. I mean, how else could one man clear the whole temple? He was a, probably a manly man. Jesus was, but uh, he was a man, hundred percent man. Just as he learned from his mother how to walk and talk. And he learned from his father how to do carpentry. Jesus learned the scriptures. He learned how to pray. And he learned how to do the will of the father. And he did the will of the father. Even though it meant suffering, he was still obedient. Through experience, Jesus came to know the cost of being obedient even in the midst of suffering. Listen to what the book of Philippians says about our Savior, our great high priest. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 6. It says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient Unto death, even the death of the cross. Do you know how difficult that must have been? Jesus was 100% man. That meant that when they beat him with the cat of nine tails, he felt the sting of the whip. He felt the, the glass bite into his flesh and rip it off of his body. When Jesus heard the crowd mocking and looked around and saw all of his disciples departing and, and leaving him there. When he saw the face of his dear mother in tears watching her son be abused like he was. He was a, he was a man. When they laid him down and stretched, stretched his arms out and they hammered nails through his hands and through his feet. He felt the pain that you would feel. Jesus, the Son of God, who came from heaven, who was in the presence of God in all of his mighty angels, as the old song says, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. Why? Because he wanted to be obedient, even if it meant suffering. The lifelong perfect obedience of Jesus provides the basis for eternal salvation. To all who call upon him as Lord and Savior. God has placed a call on your life. He's designed a mission. Especially for you. You grow into that mission through obedience. And sometimes suffering. Learning endurance by obeying even when it's hard. 
you know, you, you normally don't accomplish anything of any value in this life without some sacrifice, without some suffering. And to accomplish the call of God in your life may mean suffering in order to be obedient. You might say, well, I don't like to suffer. Well, nobody does. But it's truly a part of the human experience. Everybody suffers. People who believe in God suffer. People who don't believe in God suffer. People who try to do the will of God suffer. And people who run from doing God's will suffer. It's a universal reality, suffering. The Bible says, yea, all who would live godly will suffer. But God's power works in your life in a special way. He uses the moments of suffering endured with, with reverent submission to his will to make you perfect in fulfilling his call on your life. Jesus is truly our example to follow. What a great high priest we have. In the same way he sought to do the will of God, not his own will. The same way he lived his life in reverent submission to God's will, making prayer and fellowship with his father a top priority. The same way he learned obedience through suffering, we are called to follow in his steps. So here's what I hope you'll take away from this message today. A commitment to focus on doing God's will for your life. A focus on what his will is. A commitment to focus on spending more time in his presence. A commitment to face suffering and difficulties with a teachable, submissive spirit. An attitude of reverent submission to the will of God. That's what he wants. Jesus is the prime example. He's our great high priest, and we'll learn much more about him in the days to come. Will you pray with me now? Father, we thank you for your word tonight. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of me, can personally apply these truths to me and show me how to apply them to my life. And I pray for the same thing to happen to my brothers and sisters out there listening. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. I'm thankful for your power within us. Lord, we want to do your will. Show us what it is and help us to be willing to be obedient and submissive to it. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lord bless you folks. We'll see you Sunday morning. Lord willing, if he, if he decides to come before the end, we'll, we'll see you in the air. Amen. Lord bless you.